Those who've experienced it will testify to how a lifetime's worth of dignity and glory can be completely eclipsed by a single moment of humiliation. If you've been the victim of degradation, whether at the hands of a family member or a spouse or a colleague, an employer, or even at the hands of your very own sins, then realize that it doesn't please Allah to see you in this state. Because after all, your Lord has given himself the name Al-Aziz, which means the mighty, and you are his favored creation. A quick glance at the world around us reveals incomprehensible order that underpins it all. Our ability to exist depends on an incredibly finely tuned coordination between sun and moon and earth and wind and the earth's resources. The sun and our solar system have been located in a stable orbit within our galaxy for the last 4.5 billion years. There is so much order in nature that the scientists, by using precise laws of nature, can actually predict the course of almost any phenomenon before it occurs. But who was the one who forced these gigantic structures to submit to such precise laws, not veering away from them in the least? He was Al-Aziz, Allah said, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا ذَٰلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ The sun runs on course towards its stopping point. That is the determination of Al-Aziz, the knowing. He put it in place, لَا إِلَٰهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Who was the one who decided the duration and formation and appearance and destiny of every fetus within every womb all throughout the ages without taking a second opinion from anyone, each and every time. That is the mighty one, Allah Al-Aziz, He said, He is the one who shapes you in the wombs of your mothers as He wills. Then the verse reads, لا إله إلا هو العزيز الحكيم There is no God. There is no God except Him, Al-Aziz, the wise. Who is it that has the entirety of creation singing in his praise in a unified chorus of Tawheed, monotheism, from the trees to the billions of the planets, to every particle of dust, to every minute molecule, the chair you sit on, the clothes you wear, the distant cosmos beyond our perceptions, and all that which lies beyond perception, he is Al-Aziz. Allah said, سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ All what is in the heavens and all what is on the earth glorifies Allah and He is Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim, the wise. Who is it that imposed His might on the perished civilizations of the past who rebelled against their Lord and His messengers? As for the people of Nuh, they rebelled against their prophet. And so he called upon Allah for aid and Allah Al-Aziz responded and he would not let down Prophet Nuh. What was the outcome? The heavens opened up like gates releasing torrents of rain. And it simultaneously met with springs that gushed from the earth. This heralded an apocalypse, a remorseless flood that prevailed on earth. It climbed mountain peaks in a cataclysmic event that the world had never seen anything like before this. And by the end of it, it was said, بُعْدًا لِلْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Away with the wrongdoing people. That is the doing of Allah Al-Aziz. Then many years after Prophet Nuh, the people of Ad rose to power, a community that lived between Hadramaut of Yemen and Oman. And they boasted of physical prowess, of strength. They said, Man ashaddu minna quwa, who is more powerful than us? They rebelled against Allah. They mocked their prophet Hud and they opposed him violently. And so he appealed to Allah Al Aziz for help. And Allah wouldn't fail him. Allah said, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi'ad. Have you not seen what your Lord did to the people of Ad? What happened? Allah said, وَأَمَّا عَادٌ فَأُهْلِكُوا بِرِيحٍ صَرْصَرٍ عَاتِئَةٍ 
As for the people of Ad, they were destroyed by a furious howling wind. Which Allah unleashed, unleashed on them non-stop for seven nights and eight days. So that you would have seen its people lying dead like trunks of uprooted palm trees. Allah asks, so do you see any of them left alive? La ilaha illallah. This is the doing of Allah Al-Aziz. Years after the people of Ad, another civilization would rise to power, the people of Thamud in northwestern Arabia. Yet again, they mocked their Prophet Salih. They challenged Allah. They slaughtered the she camel that was sent to them as a sign and a miracle. So Salih, after years, would appeal to Allah to help and Al-Aziz would not let him down. So Salih said to his people that you've got three days, the countdown has begun. And when it passed, thunderbolts began to fill the air and the earth beneath them violently convulsed and their civilization was finally put to an end with a terrible shriek, a sayha that came to them from the heavens. Allah said, كَأَلَّمْ يَغْنَوْ فِيهَا أَلَا إِنَّ ثَمُودَ كَفَرُوا رَبَّهُمْ أَلَا بُعْدًا لِثَمُودَ It became as if they had never lived there. So surely Thamud denied their Lord, so away with Thamud. This is Allah Al-Aziz. The emblems of Izza might are etched on every canvas of life within the invisible columns that carry the heavens, the DNA of every organism, the so-called natural events that reduce humanity to helpless bystanders, and even within your mirror reflection that you had no say over. Wherever you look, you are redirected back to a Lord whose name is Al-Aziz. Shaykh Al-Sa'di, he said to him, belongs the Izzah, the might of power, the Izzah of dominance, the Izzah of invincibility, Therefore, no creation can reach him. He has overcome all existing beings and all what is in creation has surrendered to him and they have all been humbled by his glory. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Allah Al-Aziz. And here I take the liberty to remind you that you are attributed to him. He wants you to be dignified. Now imagine your father walking into your workplace on one afternoon only to see you being demeaned and scolded at by your employer. At that second, how would you feel for the man whom you honor and a man who has honored you and raised you to be dignified to see you in this lowly and embarrassing state? Yet here's what's baffling. This very same individual who would hate for his father to see him being degraded this very same individual may have no qualms whatsoever in being seen that very same evening by Al-Aziz as he degrades himself at the hands of sin. This person may, for example, compromise his or her religion for the sake of an employer, a team meeting. They say, you know, what can I do? He is my superior, they are my superiors, my wage is in his hands. Or this person may get dragged into things like a, a, a particular societal norm that is displeasing to Allah, but he says, I don't want to be seen as different. I'm just going to do as expected by society or friends. Is this person dignified? Is this person truly the servant of Al-Aziz? Or is this person a servant to his uh, society and his superiors and his whims? Where the inner sense of shame and darkness quietly eats at their very core every second of the day. That's exactly what happens when you widen that gulf between yourself and Allah Al-Aziz through sins. Sulaiman al taymi he said, Inna rajula la yusibu dhamba fi sirri fa yusbihu wa alayhi madallatu. A person may commit a sin in private. Yet when he wakes up the next morning, the shame of that sin can be seen on him. That's the effect of widening the gulf between you and Allah, the Most Mighty. It doesn't matter what sin you may be upon, whether it's a shady relationship that we're hiding from the public eye or from a spouse or an intoxicant of any kind which calls you over several times a day or an infatuation with online industry of indecency 
or being a slave to the fashion industry or a slave to the mirror reflection. What all of these examples have in common is a gripping sense of inner sorrow and worse still, shame that affects that sinner. And that's what happens when you allow space to grow between you and the source of all dignity and might, Allah Al-Aziz, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In our heritage, the notion of Izza, the might or dignity was precious and was ever present in the decisions of our heroes. And it was understood as inherent to the character of a true believer. Think about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's stance regarding those who refused to pay the zakat following the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At first, even Umar was unsure of Abu Bakr's decisiveness to fight them. But Abu Bakr's decision was unwavering. And he said, He said, revelation has ceased and the religion is now complete. Do you think that I'm going to allow the religion of Islam to diminish whilst I'm still alive? Dignity, a product of being connected to Allah Al-Aziz. Then think about Umar himself, radiallahu anhu. We all are drawn to his character. We love to name our children after him. Why? Because he was the emblem of Izzah, of might, of dignity. He was connected to Al-Aziz. And that's why Ibn Mas'ud, he said, ما زلنا أعزة منذ أسلم عمر. We have remained dignified since the day Umar became a Muslim. And needless to say, never was the straight exclusive to men. No, think about Sumayya, a woman whose Izzah was such that Abu Jahl himself, leader of Quraysh of Mecca, failed to coerce her to accept his values. And his failure led him to brutally kill her at the edge of a spear, the first martyr. Yet it remains that she met Allah as an honored martyr, having insisted upon her beliefs whilst Abu Jahl died disgraced with Ibn Mas'ud's foot on his face. Who was the honored one and who was the disgraced one? La ilaha illallah. Sumayyah was connected to Allah al-Aziz. Then think about Asma, daughter of Abu Bakr a pure and righteous woman who drank from the same springs of Izzah dignity that her father did. And during the Prophet ﷺ's secret migration from Mecca to Medina, Abu Jahl knocked on her door in search for her father and the Prophet. He said to her, where's your dad? She said to him, I don't know. So he slapped her across her face, tearing off her earring and she bled. Nevertheless, she stood her ground with her head held high causing the tyrant to turn back empty-handed, with his own head lowered in shame. And subhanAllah, it seemed that as Asma grew older in age, her izzah, her connection to Allah Al-Aziz only grew in strength. And that's why later on, Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, who is the name of one of the governors who served the Umayyad Caliphate, he wanted her son Abdullah dead. He wanted to kill him. And Abdullah came to his mother Asma when she was an old lady asking her for advice and seeing that his comrades had deserted him in combat. Should he continue fighting or should he surrender? But look at her response, a response that models the ideals of Izzah that I'm speaking of here. She said to him, Darbatu sayfin fi izzin khayrun min darbati sawtin fi dhul. To be struck by a sword, she said to him, in a state of dignity is better than being struck by a whip disgraced. And he said to her mom, I'm afraid also that after they kill me, they will mutilate my body. And her response was breathtaking. She said to him, son, the skinning of a sheep does not cause it harm after it is slaughtered. Nothing to be afraid of. La ilaha illallah. Izza. And then Al-Hajjaj, of course, ended up killing her son. And he sent for his mother, Asma, afterwards to speak with her. But Asma refused to go to him. So he sent for her a second time, this time threatening to drag her to him by her hair. And despite her old age and her frail body, she said to the messengers, go and tell Al-Hajjaj to come and drag me by my hair. This angered Al-Hajjaj. So he put on his shoes and he made his way towards her walking in pride. When he arrived, he started to taunt her about the killing of her son. He said, tell me, what do you think about what I did to your son? And her response was remarkable. She said, رأيتك أفسدت عليه دنياه وأفسد عليك أخراك. 
She said to him, well, I think that you've demolished his life and he has demolished your afterlife. SubhanAllah. Then she said to him, you know what's been conveyed to us? That you used to uh, mock my son by calling him son of the lady with two belts because this was her nickname, the lady of the two belts. She said, yes, I swear by Allah, I am the lady who used to wear two belts. One belt which I used to suspend the food for the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr keeping it out of reach of animals. And as for the second belt, it's a belt that every woman needs, meaning to tie her clothes together. Then she said, the Prophet ﷺ also told us that a great liar and a great murderer will be born in Thaqif. And as for the liar, we've already seen him. And as for the murderer, I believe he is none other than you. Al-Hajjaj was left without words. And he walked away without harming her. And what I find really staggering about this is that this mountain-like steadfastness which she displayed was when she was at the old age of 100 years old. Just 10 days after the killing of her son, she would pass away, having not lost a tooth from her blessed mouth. Our heritage, not just her biography, and above all of this, our belief in a Lord who is called Al-Aziz liberates the believer from the shackles of a humiliating captor. It releases him, it releases her into the mountaintops of Izzah, the meadows of an honorable Islamic life. A life with Al-Aziz renders the believer strong, even if he is bound to a wheelchair, and rich, even if poverty struck, and free, even if shackled in chains, and a living legend, even if put to the sword.